<laughs> Welcome to another episode of Sailing Ruby Rose. Now, as you can see, we are no longer on Ruby Rose. Ruby Rose is now sat comfortably in a marina in southern England waiting for the sailing season. We are in New South Wales in Australia and we are sailing this, a Seawind 1260. Now there's a few reasons for that. Reason number one is because we no longer have a boat and our new boat isn't coming to the end of this year. Reason number two, and probably more importantly, we are transitioning from a 38 foot minor hole into a 45 foot performance catamaran. To us, it made a lot of sense to learn the ropes on a slightly smaller version of the boat we're going to get. And we have been asked so many questions by our patrons as to our thoughts on how we're adapting to catamaran life, what the big differences are, what we love, what we don't like. And so these are the answers to those questions. Hope you enjoy this one. So huge thank you to our patrons for submitting some amazing questions. They always come up with the best questions. I haven't so, seen these yet. Yeah, no, Nick's going into this cold. I at least, well, I, I put the questions together. That's why I'll be looking at my phone. So um, the first set of questions regard uh, uh, pertaining to power management. Right. So get your head in that space. Yep, you're in. Okay. okay. So first of all, um, Sean and Jerry have asked, how have we found the power management and solar capacity? Does the solar have a material impact on battery charge? Okay. You, I'm answering this yet. Well, I can give it a go, <laughs> but I know we both know that you're better answering All right, so um, C1260, it's a 12 volt system and the 1370 is gonna be a 24 volt system, but let me just deal with what I can see on, on this. We have uh, 860 amp hours of battery power on this boat. So we've got a big lithium bank. We have 800 watts of solar panels, so four 200, uh, to four 200 uh, what? watt panels. <laughs> um, now, it's difficult to kind of see on days like today when it's been absolutely torrential, the amount that's going into the batteries. But on the other day, what I've noticed from the placement of the solar panels, there's two on the coach roof and then there's two on the, on the arch. We are putting in between 20 and 30 amps of solar. Now, our usage of power, the amount of current that we are drawing on while at anchor is much less than we're putting in. So looking at the, the, the current draw of all our bits and bobs, all the lights on this are LED. So we're only using about one, two amps for all the lighting at all times. Um, fridge and freezer, actually they seem to have better insulation than Ruby Rose did. So we're running about four or five amps at the moment. The freezer's actually better than I thought it was gonna be because now that it's down to temperature, the compressor's not running that often. Yeah. Maybe during this, you know, if you listen, you sometimes the compressor pops on. So on a, on a kind of like hourly basis, you know, while we're at anchor, we're probably only to keep the systems of the boat running, running at about five, six amps. Now that obviously goes up if we've got things that are running on AC, so like the television, um, charging laptops and other bits and bobs. But on a day, so it is, uh, we're in March in New South Wales, so that's the very beginning of autumn um, here. So the sun's a bit lower in the sky, we're not in high summer. But we would get probably six to eight hours of sunshine on a sunny day, and probably for four or five of those hours, we're gonna get 20 to 30 amps going in. So let's just let's just go with the, the lower figure. Mm -hmm. 20 amps um, times, say four, that's 80 amps going into the batteries from solar. Now, running on a basic, let's call it 10 amps, on an hourly basis, they go into, that goes into batteries, but that runs probably, 12 hours runs at 10, so that's 100 going in um, during the day and at night we use very, very little. Mm. So honestly, based on that, this, we are, we are using probably slightly more current than we're generating from the solar, mm. but we're moving every couple of days and the alternators on this are insane. Um, we, we're putting in 250 amps at a thousand revs, just using those master of our alternators. So from our point of view, 
Um, the solar, the 800 watts of solar doesn't quite keep up for more than a couple of three days with what we've got here. So you, there's a negative, there's an, you know, there's, there's a, an overall loss of power, um, but the alternators just completely make up for that. And we've had a few questions about, do we need wind generators on this? No, not at all. So from our point of view, if we were to move every three days and, and or get off the anchor and take, say a half an hour of motoring, that's anchor, you know, getting off of, off of a, out of an anchorage and getting onto, an, getting onto a mooring ball or, or dropping the anchor and motoring that last bit. Battery capacity is completely full on this boat. This has got 800 watts of solar. Mm. We're moving on to almost two kilowatts of solar. Yeah. And I don't believe that the systems are gonna be any more energy intensive. Yeah. We will have on Ruby Rose 2, we've got one fridge, one freezer, and one ice machine. So that theoretically is 50% more, um, more kind of online consumption from that. But overall, um, pretty happy with this. Yeah, I would say that we, I mean, I don't know actually how much difference this makes, but people, other people might use this boat differently to the way we use it. So we kind of watch the news in the morning, we watch the news in the evenings, so we have the television on for, you know, several hours a day. Um, and we work, not all day, but I would say at least five hours a day, we are on our laptops working. I don't know how much. Yeah, I mean, look, all I would say is that, you know, uh, we run two laptops, they're 100 watt chargers, and they're pretty intensive. Mm. Plus we have like a gamut, we have so many lithium batteries, batteries for, for cameras, for drones, yeah. there is always, stuff is always, there's charging. always stuff charging. Yeah. All I would say is just, when we were on Ruby Rose, we had about 400 amp hours of, of lead acid, and I was always, I always had my eye on the battery monitor. Yeah. I don't even bother with this. No, every few days we're like, are we still good? Okay, yeah, yeah, fine. Good. So, um, it hasn't been an issue going forward, we don't envisage the, 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 the power draw from Ruby Rose 2 to be significantly higher than what we're using now because it's the same systems. Yeah. Um, it's going to be the same, you know, the same BNG system. Just we, got, we have 50% more in fridges and those fridges and freezers are the things that kind of like have the most constant. Mm -hmm. But we have constant. more than twice as much solar. Yes, more than twice yeah. as much. So that's so that, not an issue. So that brings me neatly to my second question, which is um, from Jeffrey Mullins. Um, and actually, Travis, we've already answered your question quickly, which was how much solar could you mount on the 1260s? 800 watts the maximum? Uh, I don't know. I mean, this has got eight on it, so four panels at 200. Um, I think you probably struggle for space moving forward because you do need to get onto the kind of bimini top to put the sail away. Yeah. Um, and this model doesn't have flexible panels that you can walk on. Yeah. So, um, not sure. But we, we'll, we'll get an answer and we'll write it down, yeah. down the bottom. Uh, Jeffrey um, asks, is it necessary to have a gen set if you want air conditioning? We've been asked this loads of times. No. Absolutely not. So we've talked to Seawind um, a lot about this. There are a lot of new systems for aircon coming online and someone actually on the 1370 uh, WhatsApp group that we run actually put the answer the other day. So the way that aircon works is that to get to, that you need like a big kind of current draw to get the thing up and running when it first starts off and then it kind of goes into like a, a low, low current draw mode. What is that lower draw? It's about four amps. Okay. So, but the new systems will run perfectly efficiently without um, without that kind of like huge startup control. Ah, okay. So um, we are having aircon on Ruby Rose too, but we are not having. Um, we don't need a genset for it. Yeah. And I don't want the weight or the frustration no. or the reliability problems with genset. Yeah. And I suppose the question: Would you need a genset on a twelve sixty if you wanted air conditioning on a twelve sixty? It would depend on how much solar you could put on. Um, well, theoretically, if you put the same system that you put the, the, that's on the thirteen seventy onto a twelve sixty, you wouldn't need it. No. So I think the system's the same, the drawer is the same. It's just, and you know the battery capacity on this mm. is probably about. I think it is. It's those two five hundred, you know, five hundred uh, five thousand watt hour lithium batteries. So it's still a big bank on this. Yeah, okay. So yeah, you could. You'll be fine. Right. The next uh, set of questions pertain to the galley down Ooh. and also storage, and they're kind of, you know. Pretty much one of the same. Um, so Wes says, what's our opinion on the galley down? And Sean and Jerry again says, are there enough, is there enough storage for provisions? Um, are the drawers full depth? Um, are the safety latches easy and convenient? So essentially, you know, the, the kind of practicalities of um, the galley itself and the build quality of the galley. So, well, I'll, I'll take this one since you had so much to say about the solar, etc. Knock yourself. <laughs> <laughs> 
mention at this point that Nick <laughs> is the resident chef. <laughs> I you, have been, you have been peering down and demanding food from me on a regular basis, like some sort of baby sparrow with its beak open. I do make the occasional cup of tea um, and um, bowl of music. Yeah, more than that. Anyway. So I can, <laughs> I don't know why I've got the authority. <laughs> but but pray speak <laughs> on the matter of cookery aboard. Well, um, Okay, first of all, I have said this before and I'll say it again. I believe on a catamaran of about this size, I'm going to say sub 45 foot, uh, a galley down makes perfect sense because that space in that, the hull would otherwise be given over to uh, guest space and also like the, the extra shower room heads, whatever kind of arrangement is down there, um, which it depends on your you know, circumstances, but for certainly most liverboard couples, I would argue that that is not the best use of space for, you know, a, a boat that has limited space as a sub 45 foot catamaran does. Um, so therefore putting the galley down there is very, very sensible. If you were to have the galley up here, and we've seen this in lots and lots of uh, kind of 42-ish foot catamarans, you end up having not only a smaller galley, but a much smaller saloon. Um, you can see that this saloon is ginormous, particularly given that this is only a 42 foot catamaran. Like this saloon is huge. Yeah. Is it not? Look, yeah, look, honestly, the amount of space that we have, I mean, that's where this door closed. When, right. you, when you've got the door well, open. We'll come to the okay. door. So yeah. So the galley down is, it gives you a bigger galley, a bigger saloon um, for the size of boat. And in this particular design, and there's not that many catamarans with galley down, so there's only a few to compare to, but in this design, you don't feel particularly detached. That galley is still very light. Um, it still kind of communicates fairly well with the saloon. Uh, and as I said, it's very, very functional. I like the galley down in this particular um, camera. I think a clever use of space is something that we're gonna hear a lot about during this discussion. All I would say that a lot of the things we get um, about galley down, and one thing that does spring to mind is the Antares 44. Yeah. Now, when you see the Antares 44, there is um, the, the sofa in the saloon pan, you kind of like comes round, but there's a panel you can remove so you can look down into the galley. Yeah. Um, and that was the feature of the, the, the Antares 44 that I really liked. However, you lose the end seat. Yeah. Um, this, there is, a, you can see straight down. So. Yeah. While you can't, you don't have a line of sight no. on a person, you can still converse. But is it as kind of open and free as you, you know, and is it is it kind of as engaging for the person cooking if, uh, as, it, you, as it would be if you had the galley up? No, it's not. Yeah. Is that something that we're willing to put up with to get this extra space? Yes, of course yeah, it is. Sure. And what I would say to you is, apart from today, uh, when it has been absolute torrential rain, we haven't cooked down there. No. We don't cook down there. That's true. So the We've been cooking on the barbecue. So basically outside there's a mm. sink, um, tap and a barbecue. And that barbecue is coming to Australia where, you know, the, the kings of barbecue, they have uh, plates rather than kind of like the, the, the griddles. So you can cook anything on that thing. So eggs and all sorts of stuff. So we have done no cooking down in that galley. No. We literally go down there to, to pick up, a, you know, to go to the fridge. And you can get a fridge out there. There's a fridge out there, so yeah. So really, um, it, unless it's raining, there is no need to use the mm -hmm. galley for cooking. So another question, the question from uh, the other question in that kind of segment was about storage space in the galley. When I first saw the 1260, which was in Annapolis 2019, I wondered whether it would have enough storage. Um, and it's kind of a hard thing to judge when you're just kind of walking around because. You know, in that moment, you, you kind of, it's hard to keep in mind all the things that you need to put um, in that space. But having um, kind of used that galley a reasonable <laughs> amount of time. Let me just, let me just, let me just chip in. Having used that galley for a reasonable amount of time, well, to reasons <laughs> occasionally said, where's the tea bags? Um, there, for, there is enough, there's, there's more, that there's, there's, more am, than there's ample storage. However, I am going to put, uh, I'm going to put a caveat onto that. I think that, Storage by volume, there is enough in the galley, right? Storage by weight, this boat at 42 foot is a little bit sensitive, is sensitive to weight. Yeah. So 
I personally, and this is we go, we're going to do this as we go through Ruby Rose 2, everything is like, that, you know, what's the weight of that, what's the weight of that, what's the weight of that. If you want to kind of like go down and put like, oh, I'm going to put a microwave in and I'm going to put a really heavy coffee machine in and I want a, you know, a, 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 one of those ninja blenders mm -hmm. and I want an Instapot. A neutral Nutri Whatever, bullet. a Nutri bullet. <laughs> Not a ninja. Uh, they call it ninja, aren't they? Really? Yeah. Anyway. Oh, I don't know. But anyway, if we'll you get if you want to go and put like, because when we when we kind of got all our stuff off Ruby Rose, we must have had like 30, 40 kilos we of kitchen so stuff, stuff, and we left things like the bread machine and all the other bits mm -hmm. and bobs. So, kind of. What we were saying about weight on these catarans is, it's not like you buy a cataran and then suddenly you're like, oh, I better put some lead bars in there mm -hmm. and I'm gonna put my copper ingots in there and oh, where do I store this cement? It doesn't work like that. What we have seen from our own experience as liverboards and also from kind of like visiting other boats is, it creeps up. It's yeah. like, oh, five kilos there. Oh, I'll put that there. And every year thing like yeah. gets heavier and heavier. And, and heavier. so, my personal thoughts would be this boat is perfect but you've got to you you can't just fill it full of junk yeah. otherwise it's going to sink and you lose performance yeah. as per all the interviews that we did with Antoine about how sensitive catarans are to weight yeah and in terms of how like secure are the latches I mean this boat as we said um, in our review uh, two years ago that will be linked down in the description because probably some of you will want to watch it um, and I'll link it up here as well um, the the build quality is fantastic. So all of those kinds of fittings and fixtures are of really high quality. So there's no like kind of issues with that at all. Like if you close something and you put the, you know, the little latch in, then it stays closed and locked. So I've not noticed any issues. And so this is a 2019 boat, we're in 2021, so it's two years old, yeah. but it's in charter. Yeah. So this boat, and it's I think it goes for weekend charters as well. Yeah. So basically, uh, during the high season, it's ch it, it has a lot of traffic. Yeah. It's not you so it, it, um, it's not like it's been untouched. No, it's, so it does. It, 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 it mm. you know it does get a lot of use. There is no I've seen no splitting of veneers. I've seen no there's there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing. It, it's like in impeccable condition. Yeah. So um, no concerns there. Yeah. Right. Next question. There were quite a few questions regarding the bedroom situation <laughs> chicka baka wah wah in particular um, Tyler Saik I hope that I um, pronounced your name right Saik? Saik? I'm not sure um, is the headroom in that berth adequate for sitting up? now to demonstrate this we filmed a little segment earlier which I shall <laughs> overlay right now <laughs> of us lying in bed <laughs> and uh, as you can see I think, um, look, I'm five foot two and I was on like the low side and I wouldn't say that I can sit up. I can certainly kind of be in a semi recumbent position whilst reading a book or having a cup of tea or whatever. Nick, you didn't attempt to sit up, did you? You're not a sitting up in bed kind of person. No, but you can prop yourself up. Look, I think if you were to, you know, sit bolt upright in, you know, in the middle of the night, if you're if you're you six foot three, you crack your head. Yeah. But you know, I've had absolutely no problem. And okay, I don't think there's any less headroom in this boat than there was in Ruby Rose. No, there is more head height in Ruby Rose. Okay. There was more head height in Ruby Rose for sure. But um, to me, look, that was something that I was kind of like, uh, I wouldn't say there's a problem. Um, as Nick said, if you are like literally sitting upright in bed, then you probably won't be able to do that but if you're happy to recline whilst reading a book or whatever then you'll be fine the biggest issue actually regarding the head height in the bedroom um well <laughs> i wait with bated breath pray speak to the <laughs> to this audience well, actually, of, of clean-minded people there's probably two issues but we'll just stick with the one <laughs> okay i'll let you use your imagination regarding the other what are you talking about what else might you need a bit of head height in the bedroom for? The uh, fact that you archery? can't... Archery? <laughs> archery? Taking a brace of pheasants and hanging them up? I don't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's what the hatch is for. <laughs> That's what was meant to be. That had the kind of slightly weird way of approaching a professional YouTube. Anyway, carry on. I think it's important to mention that. People need to know. <laughs> yes, obviously, if you're going for the Mongolian cluster... Then, uh, and there's arms and legs all over the place and you look like a couple of epileptic spiders fighting in a biscuit tin you may struggle with the lack of headroom if however you're happy to just not go the full kind of reverse you can, you can just you can just take your activities into the after cabin where there's plenty of headroom 
I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. Okay, anyway, I think we've been on this subject long enough. I was going to say that um, making the bed. Oh! <laughs> Right. Making the bed is awkward without. You know we're going to cut all this out. Though. I'm not going to cut this out. Now that we have established all of that, yes, making the bed is a little awkward with the lack of headroom. Yes, making the bed. No, really, making the bed. Making the bed. Okay, let's move on, shall we? Right. Okay. So we're going to um, talk about I think one more really big subject um, before we wrap up this episode, and then there'll be. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> I'm just still reeling from your previous discussion about like reverse cowgirl. Look, a couple, <laughs> a couple who is living on this boat might want to know a very important thing about that bed, which is that it's a limiting, and a limiting, the same. Anyway, before we wrap up this episode, which I think everyone is now very much looking forward to, <laughs> including me. Um, no, we're gonna move on again. Uh, to talking about something very important, which is um, sa actually sailing this boat and the helm positions and motion underway. <laughs> okay, um, I'll just, start I'll just okay. no, I'll just, I'll just uh, start with the first question, shall I? Yes, start. Okay. Question. So James Bennett um, asks one of our very favourite questions of all time, and I'll let Nick answer this because if I answer it, he'll just stare at me and giggle. Um, how are the helm positions? James actually said at night. We've not sailed this boat at night, but we can still answer them. The concerns that we would always seem to have about this is to do with the double glare from the windows in front of the helm stations. Yeah. They're all electric and they go up and down and we haven't sailed with the windows up. There's no need to. We have seen absolutely no problem with visibility. We filmed a section about this the other day. So the helm positions from me at five foot nine, Terry's at five foot two, um, direct vision. There is all, there's, there's, obviously there's, there's a pillar there um, and there's two there either side of the windows. You literally need to move your head about, you know, 10 centimeters and you have full 360 visibility. You yeah. can also just look straight down the side deck, some of the helm position. So visibility, uh, helming hasn't been a problem at all. Or all I would say is that it's drier than it was on Ruby Rose. It's a lot drier here um, and there were side clears. So you can literally sit drinking a cup of tea and yeah, yeah. it's pretty, it's again, and this is this is not something that's specific to, 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 to this boat. Catamarans, you know, tend to, in many cases, have the, the advantage of fully protected helm positions, which a lot of monohulls don't give you. I mean, yeah. you know, the Amels do. Um, so if you look at Delos yeah. and, the, you know, the Amel 53 and then onwards, they're kind of with, with a hard bimini. Yeah. But even, you know, you take boats that have got a hard bimini, it's very, it's not often that the wheel and your helm position is inside that yeah. area. The Amel's in. Yeah, Amel, I think, is pretty... The only exception, really, that I think. Uh, yeah, I think some people tend to in really kind of like if you look at these expedition boats like the Garcia and the Bor Borealis or what's called the, they they have like a they're like a pilot house so there's an internal yeah, position. helm position mm -hmm. you can helm from from in here and I think in the 1370 there is going to be a forward facing chart table so you will be able to helm from in there as well yeah again um zero problem with visibility no I agree I, I really love the helm station at uh, the helm positions in this boat um, I think that they're fantastic they're super comfortable to sit at like you have no problems um, being comfortable physically um, good visibility uh, as I've said I actually said it in one of the episodes um, that we filmed on this boat is that being in Sydney Harbour was actually a really good test for visibility because there is so much traffic on the water you have to be really kind of when I say on watch you have to be watching everything all at once because otherwise you, you're gonna get caught out um, so it was actually a really good test to see exactly where the blind spots are um, and, and you know there are a couple of blind spots as Nick says but that you only need to move your head a little bit to the side and you see around them so I think that the payoff of that is the really lovely well protected helm station and something that you didn't mention is being down nice and low um, and when you are at sea and it's choppy and bumpy and uncomfortable you want to be down as low as possible Absolutely. and that brings me to um, my next question which is from Jack Chen which is how was the motion underway compared to a monohull uh, so in since we've had this boat we've done a couple of pretty bumpy passages and no problem at all this is the first catamaran I haven't felt queasy on which I think yeah. is and you know we would have been more uncomfortable on Ruby Rose just because of the additional motion and the healing yeah. 
no nothing nothing to concern yeah i agree i was pleasantly surprised at how comfortable it was um underway even in my pcs and the, there was also very little slamming so i hope you enjoyed that one honestly um we are loving this but again we're just feeding back to, to, to everyone that's asked us questions. We will be back again with a, the second part of this uh, kind of a Q&A as asked for by you. So hope you enjoyed this one. It's slightly different to the stuff that we normally do. Please feel free to subscribe. There's a little button down there and we'll be back again really soon. So thanks for watching. Goodbye.